original, mature, still looking good and easy to use, and still having an impact. I can feel totally confident when I prescribe Gonalev because uh, I'm sure that I'm making the best choice and this is the best gift that I can give to my patients. By a potency, consistency and safety. And has transformed in many ways the way in which we carry out ovarian stimulation. It was the original recombinant FSH and it emerged around about the same time as the antagonist. And together these two compounds have altered the efficacy and the safety of IVF in a very profound way. I feel safe and I feel I'm doing the best to control the ovarian stimulation on my ART patients. In my daily practice with Gonalef, I'm sure that I will maximize the oocyte yield with a reduced amount of drug used and with a better compliance for my patients. It is safety, consistency, reliability and success. I will never forget 25 years ago when I visited Serrano Laboratories in Boston and was introduced into the procedure of producing recombinant FSH, Gonal F, and became the gold standard in my center nowadays, also in addition with recombinant LH. When we started this journey, we could have never imagined it would take us to where we are today. Looking back, it was during a time of pioneering advancements in biotechnology that Gonalef was born. It was possible thanks to a deep love for science and a lot of determination. Innovation has always been an integral part of our patient-centric journey, striving to contribute towards an optimal treatment experience. And so, Gonalef has changed and grown over time, responding to your needs and your patient's feedback. Over 4 million babies have been born worldwide, thanks to your efforts and the helping hand of Gonalef. It's been an incredible journey so far, and yet all this is only the beginning. It says a lot that this product is still going strong 25 years later. Thank you and congratulations for your 25 years of life. Let's go together for 25 more. We have an exciting road ahead of us, so let's raise a toast to realizing millions of dreams yesterday, today and tomorrow. Hello everyone, welcome uh, to the Lebanese Fertility Society webinar. It is the second webinar in 2021, and it will talk about new updates in infertility. We will try tonight to answer too many questions in controversial topics in infertility. First of all, we will talk about insemination, still a place for insemination in unexplained infertility, is it useful to do it? And what are the alternatives? We'll talk after about surgery in infertility. When surgery is useful in infertility, when should we operate endometriosis, abnormal fallopian tubes, myomas, uterine malformation, and many other questions. For many other, many, many other answer for many other questions, we can ask ourselves in front of every single patient asking for its fertility treatment. Finally, what are the latest updates about COVID-19 and infertility treatment? Anything new? I want to introduce our eminent moderators, our star, Dr. Layal Abu Zaid, specialist in reproductive medicine in St. Joseph Fertility Center and Clemenceau Medical Center, she will moderate this session with the president of the North Lebanese Obstetric and Gynecology Society, Dr. Simon Shalhou, head of Department of Obstetric and Gynecology and Elusive Medical Center. I let them introduce 
our special speakers this night. Thank you. Uh, so I, I would like to congratulate uh, the Lebanese Fertility Society President uh, Dr. George Abitaya and the board to organize a regular and free webinar since one year during the COVID era with eminent speakers and, and interesting subjects and that contribute to update the knowledge of the attendees. I wish to the society a successful continuation. So uh, there is a modification in the program. Professor uh, Philippe Decon, uh, he will start uh, with his lecture. Uh, Dr. Philippe Decon is the head of the uh, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, at the University Hospital Angers, France. And he will discuss the role of the surgery in the treatment of fertility in 2021. The floor is yours, Professor Philippe Decon. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here tonight. And you know, I love Lebanon and I know many of you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And of course, thank you to my good friend Hadi, uh, who is a friend of our department. So uh, my topic was the role of surgery. And of course, uh, my colleagues, either from the surgical team or from, from the IVF team are here and work with me and help me for this lecture. And especially Professor Lejean, who is uh, um, the co-head of the department. OK, sorry. So this, the, the slides are in French, but I will speak in English. So you know that for many years, there's been an opposition between uh, us, um, IVF and, and surgery. But we have to understand that surgery can uh, improve the results of IVF, especially when you have an hydrosalpinx uh, problem with the ca uterine cavity, either a myoma, a polyp, a malformation, or when we meet endometriosis uh, problems on the ovaries or adhesions. So we have to think about this. And, and finally, the answer in 2021 is not to say, I'm doing IVF because I'm, I'm right, and you're doing, or I'm doing surgery because I'm right. But uh, we have to think about the best option for, uh, for each patient in each special situation. So we know that on the surgical side, we have many, many things to think about. And we can do surgery for many problems, either on the uterus, on the tubes, on the ovaries, or even in the called the sac de Douglas and uh, with endometriosis and adhesion. So we're going to go through all those topics and try to give a key message for each one of them. So uh, the, the first thing we have to say is uh, surgery is mainly dependent on the preoperative assessment. And of course, you need to have a very good ultrasound and also hysterosonography, hysteroscopy, MRI, or hyphosy or hycosy. So we all use this in everyday life, but it's very important to have a very good assessment. So what can we say about the tubes? Uh, there's been a very important uh, meta-analysis uh, which has been published recently. And we know that when you got hydrosalpings, hydrosal you've got a diminution of the pregnancy rate of 50% when you're doing an IVF. So in case of hydrosalpine surgery can help the IVF doctor, and uh, because you're proposing to your patient a salpingectomy. And of course, there's no uh, consequences uh, of salpingectomy on the ovarian reserve, which is not the case, of course, for endometriomas, but we'll talk about this later. Um, this is, I'm going to go through the, the video. This is a neo salpingostomy. And um, there were adhesions around the tube, which has been, have been removed. And we know that when you are doing a, a, a salping, salpingostomy, uh, we have three, 30 to 40% of uh, spontaneous pregnancy if the mucosa is good. And there are 25% of live birth. And of course, there are 9% of ectopic pregnancies. So it's not an old-fashioned technique. It has to be 
performed in se selected cases like this one. You see, it was quite easy to open the tube and then you're doing a coagulation uh, to, to get a, a, a nice tube at the end. I'm going to go through the movie and you see that we are pushing uh, the blue dye and it's working, that the, the, the tube is, is uh, has recovered. What can we say about the uterus? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry for this. Yes, so yeah, I missed one. I'm sorry. Yes, so the, uh, one very common problem is that the, the presence of polyps. And uh, we know that they are quite easy to remove. And we also know that in the literature, the, the pregnancy rate is, is four times higher uh if you're doing um an insemination so we have to do it and everybody knows this so we're all doing this uh, about the uh, myomas we all know the the meta-analysis by prits and uh, we all know that it's a very difficult topic uh because when you have uh, uh intra submucous myomas like type 0 1 or 2 uh, there's a diminution of three, three times rate of pregnancy. So we have to perform the surgery in this indication, of course. Um, this has been studied by many, many studies. And you see that when you are doing this surgery, you, you're going to see a nice video of uh, a removal of a, a submucous uh, myoma. You know that your pregnancy rate will, will be improved. So that's a good good case, and of course, it's quite easy to perform. It's not a very difficult surgery. Maybe the new thing, the improvement, is coming from the new instrumentation with the, the smaller uh, resectoscopes. And also the question is, should we use the energy to remove those myomas? You know that the HEOS system uh, has disappeared, but there, there's going to be a new one uh, in the in the next uh, month, uh, coming from the society, which is called Delmont, they are bringing into the market a new a new one. So it's it's kind of uh, an option because if you don't don't have coagulation, of course you you won't spoil the uterine cavity. We have to talk also about the big huge myomas because not all the myomas can be removed by laparoscopy or by hysteroscopy. And of course, uh, there's a consequence on infertility. The, the pregnancy rate is about is improved by 50% after myomectomy when you've got big myomas bigger than five centimeters. So the, in, the, in this option, you have to perform uh, the myomectomy. What, what can we say about the intrauterine adhesions? Um, this is a very difficult topic because it's, I think it's a very difficult surgery. Uh, of course, it has to be performed by hysteroscopy, but uh, it's quite difficult. And I think it's for experienced surgeon. If you are doing two cases during a year, then you shouldn't do it, to my, my opinion. Um, so quite difficult. There are several techniques you can use. Uh, stereoscope. You can be helped by the ultrasound. Yeah, there are many many techniques, but uh, um, it's difficult not to make a perforation of the uterus. And uh, you see that you are you have to go through, and uh, in a way, it's not so easy every day. So the pregnancy rate is in the literature 60% after surgery, and of course, the more adhesions you have, and the more difficult. Uh, will be the surgery, the less pregnancy you'll have. Sorry. Okay. So what's about the uterine malformations? Of course, we know that uh, uh, we, we, all, we meet the, the, the uterine malformation in, in our consultation. And uh, uh, the arcuate uterus uh, is the most common uh, malformation. And it, it's involved uh, altogether, the uterine malformations are involved in 50% of the cases of infertility. And the number of uh, miscarriage is uh, uh, three to four times more if you have a uterine malformation. There is a, uh, an important topic, which is uh, uh, we, in, in case of a septate uterus, should we remove it or not? 
um, there are many, many uh, studies in the literature and um, some people say, okay, you have to perform the, the removal of septoplasty in patients uh, who, wish, uh, who have a wish of pregnancy. Some uh, authors say, no, you have to wait till you have a miscarriage or not. Uh, it's uh, uh, in, in, our, in our team, we are performing the surgery in those cases because we have the impression that it's improving the pregnancy rate. So here you see uh, a, a small video, a very nice septum. You see the, the tube here, the right tube here. We see the septum and then we go through the left tube and you can uh, remove we, this is the versa point that everybody knows. You can also use scissors. Uh, you can be guided also by the ultrasounds. The, the main rule is uh, not to go too far, of course. And the, the rule is that when it starts bleeding, you have to stop. And when you see the two tubes, you have to stop because it's going to be, uh, you have a risk of perforation. So quite easy going. We are, of course, doing the surgery in one day, one day patients. You see here, it starts bleeding. We're at the bottom. And so we're nearly going to stop. And at the end, the uterine cavity uh, is safe and uh, is good to, for a new pregnancy. OK, I'm going to go at the end. You see, you, we see the tube here, so it's we don't have to go further on because you've got the risk of perforation. And you see that the uterine cavity is perfect here now. Okay, and so uh, another video for this septum. You see that you can also use uh, bipolar coagulation and uh, you can remove the septum quite easily also and you can also use the scissors and the uh, ultrasound guidance okay so i think everybody knows this so when you are doing this surgery you are diminishing the rate of miscarriage by four so it's quite interesting when you have got the diagnosis we all know also that the uh, differential diagnosis is the the, the bicornuate uterus so um, some, some topics are uh, discussed, like hypertrophia of the endometrium, like uh, uh, surgery for metroplasty or the hismo cell, uh, what they call in the English literature, the niche. Uh, um, we have been uh, working in our team with Professor Lejean, he's an expert of the hismo cell surgery. You see on, this, on, on the video on the right side, you see uh, surgery of the hismo cell by vaginal route. You know that you can do this by, by laparoscopy. We are doing a lot of laparoscopy in our team, but not in this indication because we have the impression that the uh, vaginal, the hysteroscopic route is better. And you see that uh, the principle is to, first of all, it's to see the hismo cell, it's, uh, the, the niche. It's, it's not so easy sometimes because you can miss it. And when you see the hole, when you see the gap, you have to make regulation around it. And as you see, th th this is a quite, a quite good example here. And this is typically uh, uh, so, so this kind of things we didn't see 10 years ago. We didn't talk about it. We didn't know it. We didn't even know it. OK. And you see that uh, we have. Uh, uh, of course, miscarriage after the surgery, and we have uh, uh, placenta accreta, a possibility of placenta accreta. So it's quite uh, um, discussed surgery. So you see, if we go further on that uh, uh, little step by step, we are making the coagulation around the hole, and then um, the procedure will be over. So obviously it's easier than by laparoscopy where you have to make a whole dissection of the bladder and make the suture. Uh, there are several trials comparing uh, uh, the techniques and uh, nowadays there's not one which is considered as superior as the others. Okay, here we are. So the ovaries now, the ovaries is a huge topic as we know. And um, 
we uh, what about the the, the ovarian drilling so we we know that it's a good option uh, when we have tried the medical treatment and we can do the ovarian drilling by uh, laparoscopy or by fertiloscopy opening the douglas uh, the douglas cul-de-sac so uh, it's quite easy just making holes in it you, you see on the right side on the video a fertiloscopy so you have to go through the Douglas cul-de-sac and the, yes, here it is. And the video will show you, you put the video inside and then you'll be in the pelvic cavity. You're looking at the ovaries and then you're making all the small holes on the ovaries. Here we are. So going inside the vagina. Okay, we're inside, sorry, inside the pelvis. Here, we see the ovary here. And we are doing the small holes. You have to go quite far. It, it, it has not been too much superficial. You see, it's about five millimeters inside the ovary, like this. And then you have to repeat it. The minimum is uh, in the literature, you have to make 10 holes. So to my opinion, it's much more easy by laparoscopy because the ovaries are easier to assess. Um, but it, this video was just to say that it's possible by, by fertiloscopy. Um, this is here, it's a laparoscopic procedure. You see how easy it is, much more easy. So many, many holes. Okay. So um, it has been proven in the literature that there are 40% of pregnancy in the year following the drilling procedure. So, and there are less uh, multiple pregnancies after the drilling. So it's quite a good option on polycystic ovaries. Okay. Sorry. Uh, about the ovarian cyst, um, we know that uh, for endometriosis, there's a, um, a lower AMH uh, rate after uh, the procedure, the cystectomy. You know that we've been uh, taught to do the cystectomy by laparoscopy. And uh, finally, since 10 years, we have a, a consideration for the, the ovarian reserve. And we know that even though we think that the cystectomy was easy, uh, there is a, a diminution of the AMH levels. So we did publish with uh, uh, my colleagues a uh, paper in fertility sterility saying that we have to be very cautious and to, it's not that easy procedure that we, we thought it was. And uh, patients have to uh, be told that uh, it's, it's not so easy. We have to check the, the ovarian reserve before and after. Uh, of course, there's a, um, uh, we, we have to think about the cryopreservation. In the literature, uh, there is no real re uh, improvement of IVF results after cystectomy. So you're not uh, performing the cystectomy, either an endometrioma or dermoidosis, you're not performing it because you want to improve the fertility. You're, you're performing it because the cyst is painful. And in all the international recommendations, uh, the, the consensus is after five centimeters. So the message is, the take home message is no surgery to improve the fertility in case of cyst and in case of endometrioma. Uh, after the peritoneal cavity and the Douglas cul-de-sac, of course, um, the, it's the problem of endometriosis. And we know that uh, we are performing surgery. We don't know if the fact of performing surgery in case of deep infiltrating endometriosis is improving the fertility. We, we have a trial in France. Sorry, I went a bit fast. We have a trial in France conducted by our colleague in, uh, in Lille, Pierre Collinet, uh, to assess um, the, the role, if it's better to propose an IVF or a surgery if you have a deep infiltrating endometriosis. Nowadays, the literature says that there's no improvement uh, because of surgery, but there's an ongoing uh, trial 
and we'll have the answer next year probably. Uh, last last point is uh, desiolysis, and uh, in our uh, French recommendation, our French college recommendation, which were in 2017, uh, we know that uh, it's not useful if the uh, desiolysis is difficult and if it's going to be bleeding, it's not sure that it's improving the fertility. But in case of uh, small adhesions around the tube, it can be of interest to remove them, but because it's better to free the tube, but not if it's a completely uh, um, a frozen pelvis, because the coagulation and so on will not improve the fertility. Here it was a good example because you see an adhesion which was just around the tube, so you can imagine that it's going, it's going to improve your fertility. Here we are. So the take-home message is we don't have to say uh, my IVF is better or my surgery is better. We have indications for surgery. And of course, in many, many situations, surgery will improve uh, your IVF treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor De Camp, for Thank this, you, Professor. Uh, for this uh, okay. uh, practical yeah. uh, conference. I have two questions. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the um, uh, laparoscopy and hysteroscopy for idiopathic infertility? Uh, normal hysteroscalpangogram, everything is normal. Before doing any uh, uh, PMA, assistant uh, medical uh, procreation, uh, is there any indication for this uh, surgery? Okay, so the question is, if everything is normal, uh, should we practice a, a systematic hysteroscopy or laparoscopy? Uh, in our team, we're not doing this, but uh, I, I don't think there's a real consensus, but because it's, uh, uh, you, you could feel like doing it because a patient asks for it in, in most cases, so you can check, you can take a look. So, but in, in, in normal life, we, we're not doing it systematically. Okay. And Are you doing it on your side? Do you, you prefer me? No, okay. That's cool, so I prefer to go to insemination or... Uh, yeah, of course, uh, of course. It's normal. Uh, the other question, after a, a cure of septum surgically, yep. uh, what do you do personally? You go directly for treatment or you put a loop or you treat by high-dose estrogen? What is the lapse time uh, to go... Uh, Après le... Into Yes, after the prise in charge of a septum, what do you do as a conduit to hold the fertility? Okay. Okay, so the, the, the rule we have is we are doing a diagnosis hysteroscopy six weeks after, <laughs> uh, which is very important for the, the miscarriage rate. It's not really for fertility, but it's important for the miscarriage rate. So we are doing it systematically after six weeks. And after we start the treatment. And after a remove of septum, you don't give any treatment. Just no, no, we don't. No more. No, we did, but no more. Après, oh. après les synergies, oui, par contre. Well, if you have if you have adhesions, intrauterine adhesions, we're yeah. we're giving uh, estrogens, uh, not in case of septum. Okay. Uh, uh, there is some question from the audience. Uh, Dr. Surur Randur uh, asks, is there a recommended time and interval between myomectomy and starting an IVF cycle? Est-ce qu'il y a un délai de temps à respecter uh, entre une myomectomy and uh, a cycle de fibre? Well, it's not, uh, it's not really obvious in the literature. My, my uh, recommendation for my patient is uh, uh three to six months so uh, the minimum is three three months uh, but if they can wait when i mean when i'm saying they can wait i mean if they are not 41 if they are you see what i mean uh, they can wait a little bit maybe six months is better after it depends on the myomectomy you're talking about laparoscopic myomectomy or or hysteroscopic hysteroscopic Okay, sorry. I thought you were talking about uh, uh, laparoscopic with huge myoma. So I, I wanted to say, by uh, if you're talking about laparoscopy, it depends on the size of the myoma, the suture, the quality of the suture, but at least three months. Uh, after hysteroscopic myomectomy, uh, you can go through quite quickly. 
Pierre Manuel is right beside me. What do you think? One month, two months? Yeah, after after hysteroscopy, uh, we we see again the, the patient uh, one month after the, the surgery to assess uh, the tolerability of the post surgery and uh, the time to schedule the to the IVF treatment or uh, IRT treatment. We we wait uh, at least two months to to begin uh, treatment after myomectomy uh, by hysteroscopy. After uh, myomectomy by uh, laparoscopy or uh, laparotomy, we, we, we will wait uh, uh, at least three months and um, the average is six months to have a, a, good, uh, a good cicatrization. But back to the, the answer, uh, it's the same answer as the, as the septum. We are doing a hysteroscopy diagnosis uh, six weeks after, because it's very important to assess uh, there is no adhesions and so on. Very important for the miscarriage rate. We have a last question. What do you think about the ovarian drilling? This is a question from uh, Anonymous. Uh, is it controversial uh, sometimes? Uh, are you uh, um, with or against the ovarian? In which case you practice this? You practice this uh, uh, we, we, uh, at Angers University Hospital, we uh, we continue to to propose uh, drilling because uh, we we have a good results to um, to obtain uh, spontaneous ovulation after and uh, with expectation uh, we have a good probability if if um, if pa if the patient is young we propose the drilling. Uh, um, D'emblée, you don't try before clomiphene or anything. What are the criteria? Is it severe or safe? No, uh, après, après échec de stimulation. Après en fait, uh, en, en cas de P PCOS anovulatoire qui ne répond pas bien au clomide ou uh, au gonadotrophine, on va tenter uh, le drilling pour uh, ramener. So maybe for English speaking uh, colleagues and friends, uh, uh, we. we it... Uh, the, the first step could be, and uh, if after the clomid treatment you have uh, an ovulation we are doing the drilling and about the technique as I said uh, my, my my take for drilling is laparoscopy because I'm not very good in fertiloscopy Professor Lejean who is working with us is very good in fertiloscopy so it was easy or the fertiloscopy it depends but finally I mean it's not a big for the women and uh, but I think the important thing is to do a correct drilling which means 10 holes uh, if you're doing a fertiloscopy and if you cannot really look at the ovary see it properly and if you're doing only three holes I think it's not good you have to do a laparoscopy okay so 10 holes in each ovary yeah so yes. yeah. Yeah. yeah 10 per ovary no. yes 10, 10 each ovary. yes yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the with the bipolar, with the bipolar. Okay. And uh, the ovarian drilling uh, can prevent the hyperstimulation uh, ovarian syndrome? Yes. Uh, yes, it can. And also the multiple pregnancies. In the literature, it's very clear. So, uh, no, it, the, you know, the literature says 40% of pregnancy after your drilling, spontaneous, and less uh, hyperstimulation syndrome. I have a small question regarding the ismothil. I know it's not common practice, but I saw that you're doing hysteroscopic, uh, not repair like cauterization of the at the ismothil site. Uh, my question is: Do you uh, change your way whether the patient is seeking fertility or not by choosing laparoscopic versus hysteroscopic repair? Because as we know. Hysteroscopic repair of the ismothil may not uh, may not uh, may leave the defect of the ismothil there, while the laparoscopic repair may be able to close the defect completely. Okay, so I think the answer it, it really depends on the size. Uh, I think if you have a big, big one, it's easier and, and more accurate to, per, to perform a vaginal uh, hysteroscopic route. Uh, if you have a small one, you can do a, a laparoscopy. But I think the, 
it depends on the teams because uh, I don't know uh, many surgeons who are doing both. You, you see what I mean? So um, I think hysteroscopic treatment is easier really than, uh, even though I'm doing a lot of laparoscopy, but first of all, we don't have so many cases. We, if you are honest, uh, how many cases do we have per year here? Two? Ten. 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 No, but in the operating we room. We have a lot of C-sections. Yeah, 20%. Uh, how many C sections do you have? Fifty uh, percent. Okay, okay, so a little bit more, but not not so much. Uh, we have yeah. uh, the, the the main indication of uh, niche uh, hysteroscopic treatment is a recurrent implantation failure, uh, IVF failure. Okay. Yeah, this is the point. Yes. The cut off you that you take on the wall to decide the the, the approach. Off it, uh, Combien de millimètres de l'épaisseur du myomètre restant sans une IRM? 2.5 millimètres. Merci. C'est la littérature, oui. Yes. Uh, Dr. Hanoun uh, want to ask a question. Dr. Hanoun, are you hearing us? Sorry. Now you hear me? Yes, we Can are. You you. Okay, I have two small questions. Um, the first one: What's the size of the polyp that you decide? What's the cutoff size of the polyp to decide on hysteroscopic polypectomy? And the second question: If you are correcting, if you are doing multiple myomectomies for the sake of fertility, do you prefer? laparoscopic or open myomectomy? Okay, so yes, thank you. It's a very important question. Thank you, Dr. Hannon. Um, the, for, for the polyp, normally in the literature, it's written 15 millimeters. But if you're doing office hysteroscopy and if you've got the HEO system, which means no coagulation, uh, you can give a small cut, you see, even if you have a smaller polyp. So, you know, it's quite easy. There's no coagulation. You are not damaging the uterine cavity. So that's not a big problem. Uh, but uh, from, from 15 and over, you have to remove it. This is mandatory in terms of fertility. Second question was uh, laparoscopy or laparotomy for myomectomy. Um, this is a, a very important question. First of all, it depends on the size and the number of, of the myomas. Then, as you know, we have the problem of the extraction and the morselation of the myomas, uh, which is a new problem since five or six years. So uh, what we quite easily do now is doing a laparoscopy, remove the myoma by laparoscopy, open the, the uterine cavity and remove the myoma, make the coagulation. And very often we make a small incision and we use the alexis, you know, uh, to open the, the, the uh, abdominal wall and it's quite easy. Uh, and then we, we make the suture through the abdominal wall. So everything is possible, but uh, I, th I think if you have a big one, it's better to do a small laparotomy or multiple. Okay, thank you. For the quality of the suture and for the pregnancy, of course. There's another question after this question is, uh, when do you allow the pregnancy after? And we are in our team, we're waiting for three months. Uh, the minimum is three months because you have to, you, you need to have a, a repair of the the uterine wall yeah i agree with this because the previous literature uh, used to say that you have for you have to wait for six months or more yeah but in fact i don't wait that time i also wait for three months and then we attempt pregnancy yeah and I think... because uh, it will take time for the uterus you know even if a pregnancy occurs yeah. The yeah. pregnancy it will take time for the uh, to for uh, I mean for the uterus to enlarge and to affect the the <clears throat> the wound. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It won't work at the first cycle either. So you can yes, but th three three to six months. But yes, it depends. Uh, recently, I did a, a myomectomy with huge myomas with an African patient. You know, she had. Uh, uh, what we call uh, the pelvis africain, you know, with many, many myomas. 
And I've been waiting for six months and I did a laparotomy because it was a mess and uh, with many adhesions, huge myomas after you have the morselation, the extraction. So finally, it's no big deal to do a small incision like a C-section. Uh, 20 to 30% of women have a C-section. So come on, if you want a pregnancy, you can have a, a, an incision. It's not a mistake. And uh, after myomas, many times we have to do cesarean yeah, if a pregnancy. Yeah, yeah, of course. Not always. Okay, but thank you. Often, yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanoun. Uh, we have a question for, from Dr. Ghaname and another uh, question from Dr. Asi. Dr. Ghaname, we are hearing you. Are you hearing us? Il y a un petit commentaire du docteur Chaban. La cicatrisation de myomètre est très rapide, trois mois, c'est complètement suffisant quand il est d'attendre de même après une césarienne. Expert opinion. And will... En attendant, docteur Ranami, from Rami Issa, would you, hello, you, would you go for menses suppression for three to six months by Dionogest or GNRH agonist? Plus cyst aspiration in the case of endometrioma, a five centimeter in patient with full ovarian reserve before IVF. Dr. Professor Decon. Okay, so sorry, I didn't really get it. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Est-ce que vous faites une suppression de trois à six mois par agonist LGNRH, LHRH, ou avec une aspiration du kyste d'un endométrium de 5 cm chez une patiente avec une réserve ovarienne faible avant l'IVF. No, no, I don't think so. Uh, but there's an important message I, I want to give. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing a lot of, with endometriosis. The, the key message is if you are uh, giving agonist, you have to give an ad-back therapy, never give an agonist alone. You know, so you give either uh, an OCP or either estrogens, but never agonist alone. But not not to, to answer the question, no, if you have a five centimeters endometrioma, uh, not systematically uh, a medical treatment, no. Il fallait réserver toute la session à professeur Descamp. Il y en a beaucoup de questions pour que l'intervenant. Moi, je suis bien avec vous. Hein, je... On peut rester. <rire> On prendra une dernière question de Dr. Ghanaï. Vous nous entendez? Oui, euh, oui, 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 salut, bonsoir. Uh, one, one question. Does the ovarian drilling affect the ovarian reserve or no? If we do it, huh? because there's some study said by doing this, we can affect the ovarian reserve. So is it true? What do you think about it? Yeah. Well, you, you have um, uh, a diminution, but it's, it's going up after, so it's tra transitory, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not like the, the, the problem of the uh, endometriosis cyst. When you are removing the cyst and when your ovarian reserve is diminishing, it won't grow again. But in, in, uh, well, after drilling, it will grow again. C'est pour ça qu'il faut utiliser une croix bipolaire pour pas que ça devienne yeah. trop long. Yeah, okay. uh, Pierre Manuel tells me you, you need to use bipolar coagulations to to avoid the diffusion in, into the uh, ovarian tissue. Okay. Et je salue et je salue Wendy. Oui, salut, salut Philippe. Thank salut. You so much. Salut, ça fait plaisir. Oui. Thank you so much, Professor Descamps for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation and very practical and uh, thank you very much thank thanks thank for it's been a pleasure see you both see you both. thank you and thank you to pierre manuel thank and you. to guillaume guillaume is here guillaume lejean au revoir merci thank you to all au revoir merci thank you very much au revoir. thank you merci à vous merci simon So, the topics of Dr. Walid Rotmi say COVID-19 vaccine and infertility, unfounded claims or justified panic. Dr. Walid Rotmi is, is the founder and chairman of the Fertility Center, and he is a president-elect of uh, Lebanese Fertility Society. The floor is yours, Dr. Walid. Can you share your screen, please?
Is it shared now? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank the Lebanese Fertility Society Committee and Science Pro for organizing this webinar. And special salute to Dr. George Abitaya for his exemplary leadership of the society during the last two years, despite all the obstacles and restrictions and lockdowns. Uh, although we couldn't organize and attend live, he, on the other hand, could find alternative ways to revive the society and the CME activities within, and he did it very well. Uh, in today's world, social media is not only part of our daily routine, but it is the poison that almost everybody is willingly susceptible to it with all the misinformation it involves. We daily and deliberately ingest fake news which in most instances bypass our center of reasoning and question. Thus, Dr. Walid, can you put full screen, please? So one social media post regarding COVID-19 vaccine leading to infertility and initiated a cascade of fear and unnecessary vaccination reluctance, which subsequently opened the door to a debate, which is still going on, whether the post claims with all the panic induced are justified. What made these claims influence people is that high degree, in that high degree is that they were fired at a time where there is global division regarding the legitimacy of the vaccine to control this pandemic. Now, a survey of fertility patients' attitudes towards the COVID-19 vaccine was, was launched by the Columbia University Fertility Center with an objective to survey fertility patients' perception and willingness to receive the messenger RNA vaccine. A total of 284 patients completed the survey with a low response rate of 9.6% of those emailed. Among all replying infertility patients, 119 or about 42% would accept a messenger RNA vaccine if offered. Among the pregnant fertility patients, only 17.3% expressed their willingness to receive the vaccine. Those planning to conceive in the next six months showed 41.3% approval compared to 65% approval for those not planning to conceive. Among fertility patients planning to accept the vaccine, 89.9% are not planning to change their treatment plans post-vaccination. This is said, let's go back to where all this COVID vaccine-related infertility panic started. Now, in early December, a German physician and epidemiologist named Wolfgang Wodard, who has always been skeptical about the need for vaccines in other pandemics, along along with the former Pfizer scientist, teamed up to ask the European Union FDA counterpart to withhold the approval of the Pfizer vaccine for several concerns, among which a protein called Synthetin-1, which shares the same genetic instructions with part of the spike protein of the coronavirus and is an important component of the placenta in mammals. If the vaccine triggers antibodies against Sensitin-1, it might also cause the body to attack and reject the protein in the human placenta and thus causes miscarriages. This revived 
the old conspiracy theory that vaccines could be deployed for global population control. Indeed, the theory was woven into a plot prior to this post in a fictional movie called Utopia, where a drug maker creates an illusion of a flu pandemic uh, to convince people to take a vaccine which reduces human reproduction. This series was written in 2013 and was filmed prior to the pandemic in 2019. Another spread of pepper over the theory was that the Pfizer CEO recently elected not to receive the vaccine last month, raising doubts about the reasons behind his decision, although he made it clear that he is not in the age category which should be given the vaccine at this stage. Now, facts are that more than 25 million documented and around 75 million estimated Americans were infected in the United States so far by a real virus called COVID-19. And yet, according to the ASRM, there is no evidence or at least observation of a trend that this pandemic has changed fertility patterns so far. The fertility and sterility dialogue was published last month and contributed for by nine academic and private centers in the United States, discussed the claims and social media panic regarding the effect of Pfizer messenger RNA vaccine on female fertility. They concluded that although women that were trying to conceive pregnant or lactating were not included in the Pfizer or Moderna clinical trials, uh, there, there seems to be enough information to suggest that these vaccines do not result in female infertility. Furthermore, the discussion stated that the low biological plausibility for harm from the vaccine in contrast to the real risk of contracting COVID-19 should be seriously considered when making the decision to get the vaccine. Last month, the ASRM issued an update, which is update number 11, on the COVID-19 vaccination safety in response to the FDA emergency use authorization of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for ages 16 and older. The task force recommended the vaccine for patients who are planning to conceive, who are pregnant, who are lactating in line with the ACIP and CDC and ECOG recommendation. Patients undergoing fertility treatment are also encouraged to take the vaccine. The task force concluded that since the messenger RNA vaccine is not composed of a live virus, it is not thought to cause an increased risk of male or female infertility. And it is not believed to cause any first or second trimester fetal loss, stillbirth, or congenital anomaly. Now, what is somehow unclear is that all these recommendations and approvals, be it by the ASRM, the FDA approvals, or the CDC, are not really based on clear observational studies in pregnancy, nor on data from phase three trials, which we know excluded the pregnant woman. Even if their conclusions are based on observations, these lack the necessary high level of evidence that we need. Now, back to basic science, despite, <coughs> despite being new, the messenger RNA vaccine technology appears to have a good safety profile based on two major studies 
published in the New England Journal of Medicine in December of last year and last January, one by Pollack et al. and the other by Baden et al. They stressed on the inability of messenger RNA to modify DNA. Uh, the vaccine or the messenger RNA enters the cell, gets translated into the spike proteins known as SARS-CoV-2 glycoproteins, and thus it elicits an immune response by activating helper T cells and B cells. Antibodies to the newly formed glycoproteins are then induced by B cells which builds the immunity against the COVID-19 virus. In Baden's study, which is a randomized double-blind trial intended to evaluate the efficacy and safety of the vaccine, 30,420 participants more than 18 years of age were included and assigned to a vaccine and placebo group and were followed during and up to two months post the second dose of the vaccination. The protection from the vaccine started as early as two weeks after the first dose, and the side effects were usually mild and uncommon. Serious side effects were rare. However, the safety regarding fertility, which needs longer follow-up, was not documented. Now, the panic and fear from Woodard's warnings are that the vaccine spike protein having similar amino acid sequences as syncytin-1 might induce an immune response against syncytin-1 leading to infertility and recurrent miscarriages. However, in the fertility sterility dialogue that we mentioned previously, it was clarified that the vaccine contains neither syncytin-1 nor its messenger RNA exact sequence. So according to them, there is no homology between the antigenic epitopes of the vaccine and those of syncytin-1, and that even if there is cross-reactivity, immune cross-reactivity and binding, this will not impair placental function. Personally, I have read the dialogue, and I couldn't find how these groups could deny or negate the biological plausibility of Woodard's conspiracy theory, which, whatever fictional elements it may contain, it deserves a surgical analysis and further investigation. Now, to negate the possibility of cross-reactivity of induced antibodies, the groups didn't present evidence-based data, and I encourage all of you to read both articles and the dialogue and make up your own opinions regarding this. Their only plausible argument for the safety of the vaccine, and I'm talking now about the dialogue, with regards to fertility, can be summarized in the following two points. One, even if the SARS-CoV-2 surface glycoprotein and syncytin-1 share similar amino acid sequences, they don't code for the same proteins that the vaccine forms antibodies to. Second, due to the process of clonal deletion, T cells that can recognize the epitopes expressed on endogenous proteins like syncytin-1 are usually eliminated in the thymus gland during early embryonic development. But again, this needs validation and further studies should be initiated. Now, the other study by Polak et al. and the multinational group published, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, early January. This ongoing multinational placebo-controlled observer-blinded pivotal efficacy trial randomly assigned persons 16 years or older in a one-to-one -one ratio to receive two doses 21 days apart of either the placebo or 
the BNT162B2 vaccine, which is a modified RNA vaccine that encodes a membrane anchored SARS CoV 2 spike protein, similar to the other uh, studies. The primary endpoints were, were the efficacy of the vaccine against laboratory confirmed COVID 19 and its safety. Now, in this study, a total of 43,548 participants underwent randomization, of whom 21,000 720 received the vaccine and 21,721 received the placebo. There were eight cases of COVID-19 with onset at least seven days after the second dose among the vaccine receivers. On the other hand, there were 162 cases among the placebo group. So the vaccine was 95% effective in preventing the disease regardless of age, sex, and race. And this was regardless also of the body mass index or pre-existing medical condition. Now, this spoken about efficacy, the adverse effects uh, which were included in the report were only up to 14 weeks or three months after the second dose and it shall continue for two years. Then, and only then, shall we know if fertility is affected or not. Now, the idea of contraceptive vaccines or immunocontraception has been introduced in mice more than a decade ago. When Professor Christopher Hardy published his mouse-specific immunocontraceptive peptide or vaccine. The peptides were derived from granulocyte macrophage, colony stimulating factors, sperm proteins, SP56, and proliferin, PLF. This vaccine induced antibodies and reduced the mice fertility by 50% at that time. Since then, the discussion of peptide and messenger RNA-based anti-infertility vaccines in humans started. Around the same time, Sivapurapu et al. published a study about injecting two chimeric peptides, BMZP1 and BMZP3, into monkeys. Now, a significant inhibition of sperm binding capacity to the zona pellucida ensued without cause, causing any real ovarian damage. The question is, is human contraception real? And if so, is there someone or some power which is forcing it at the global level? level? Should we believe in conspiracy theories or should we not? Alan Moore once said, the main thing that I learned about conspiracy theories is that conspiracy theorists believe in a conspiracy because that is the most comfortable thing to do. The truth of the world is that it is actually chaotic. The truth is that it is not the Illuminati or the Jewish banking conspiracy or the gray alien theory, theory, or Pfizer, the truth is far more frightening. Nobody is in control of this world. The world is rudderless. Who controls it? I guess we shall never be able to know for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rotme, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation and especially the conclusion. I'm scared, but maybe it's the truth. Uh, let's start with the question. Anyone having a question? 
So you, you about, why, about you, aliens, if you want. No, no, you have the answers. If you have, we can ask about aliens. So uh, what are you doing for your patient? If uh, a patient uh, aiming to do a cycle of IVF and uh, having the intention of getting the vaccine, do you advise her to do it? And uh, if yes, does she need to wait? Yes. I'm advising everybody to take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I'm advising pregnant ladies, ladies who are planning to go for IVF, patients who initiated their cycles of IVF, patients who are breastfeeding, I'm advising them all to take the vaccine. At the personal level, I've taken two types of vaccine so far. Why? Why? We knew it, that you took the Chinese and then you took the Pfizer. I was waiting for the vaccine. In December, I could take the first uh, Sinopharm dose in uh, December. I took the second dose in January. And two days ago, I took the first dose of Pfizer. Why? Because uh, I can't see why not. Dr. Walid, uh, they ask uh, Dr. Mustafa Shaban, how about the other vaccine of COVID? The other question, what about Ox Oxford vaccine? Uh, what about the theory of co-infection with a virus that has an inverse transcriptase that helps RNN to become DNA. RNA to become Your DNA, opinion. to contaminate our DNA? Yeah, I don't by, think by, there is any by vaccine. Inverse, by inverse transcriptase, because yeah. can enter the nucleus and become uh, DNA. And um, maybe uh, probably integrated with the DNA well, of the nucleus. Well, I'm not an immunologist. I'm not an immunologist, but as much as I know, I don't think it's even thinkable that the messenger RNA can infect our DNA. I, I, I may be wrong, but uh, uh, I think uh, if someone thinks so, we need his argument. With all my respect to uh, Dr. Steve. So I'm so contraindicated uh, for the woman uh, who wants to conceive or is pregnant or lactating to take the vaccine or can take the vaccine, yes? I'm sorry, what was the question? I ask if all can take the vaccine, the, the woman who wants to conceive or uh, pregnant woman or lactating woman. No contraindicated uh, in the field, yes? No. Uh, as I stated before, the ASRM, the American Society, issued its update number 11 two months ago. And it is clear. And it's not an ASRM uh, recommendation only. It's an ASRM, ECOG, uh, Society of Reproductive uh, of Maternal Fetal Medicine, uh, the ACIP, all of them recommend that the vaccine be taken by pregnant women, women who are undergoing fertility treatment and breastfeeding women. Okay, thank you. Here. Can I add, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, can I add something? Yes. Uh, I, I my name is Ronnie. I practice. Ronnie. Yeah, I practice in New York. At first, I cannot agree more with Doctor Gutme with what he said. I mean, I'm very pleased to hear him saying that. And I always found it very interesting that the vaccine skeptic are the one who are the one who wants to take the hydroxychloroquine or or ivermectin, which I never heard of till when somebody asked me like in in Lebanon about it. So it's very interesting when they want to go for the. 15, 20, 30 patient studies, and they don't want to believe the 70 plus thousand studies. That's that's my first comment. Second is I could tell you what's happening, at least in New York. Uh, as of five days ago, three days ago, pregnancy put you in the high risk category, meaning um, 
if you're pregnant, you actually have priority to get the vaccine now. So after doing it to a healthcare provider, teacher, now it's open to more than 65 a diabetic patient, cardiac patient, hypertensive, and pregnant patient. And obviously there is a reason there based on the, the different societies guideline, based on, unfortunately, as you guys all know, New York was hit very hard early on. And, and, and we have a lot of data on how bad those pregnant patients did who they get caught COVID. I mean, they have around three, three times the ICU admission rate. Nobody's talking about that because even three times is still very low. It's still like you know, around nine per thousand versus three per thousand for their comparable age group. I think if you tell the patient that, that you have three times the risk of ICU admission proven, at least on, on from thousands of, of patients versus the potential risk of anything else, just pick your poison, basically. I mean, pick and choose. Yes, but the problem also is they need a confirmation that uh, the vaccine will not affect neither the um, the fertility, neither the baby. And is it something that we can we can take on our responsibility as a doctor? I understand that we should advise because she is at risk. But can we uh, aff affirm? Uh, well, that unfortunately, I mean, I, I agree with you. Not, not, nobody can give you a year worth of data for the obvious reason. But so many things we practice. When we first did IVF, even up to now, do you know that IVF patients are not babies are not we're not gonna get infertility when they're older? Now we know because they were able to conceive and we know that they were not gonna get cancer early on. Now we know biological plausibility. And I'm talking, I mean, I'm not a vaccine expert, not a biologist, but we, we had a lot of lectures within our institution and other by from NIH people and et cetera. Biological problems should dictate sometimes something. And biologically, like Dr. Gutmi said, I mean, it's an mRNA that's most likely, actually many vaccines they're saying will turn to be that. Like now that they can assure how most vaccine will become like this. But, you know, being a patient, I completely agree with you, Dr. Abizan. Like you, you're, not, you're not gonna tell somebody we have data or so, but we can tell them the data that we have on getting COVID. And, so I tell my patient, we're not asking you to take it, but I tell them that if you're comfortable taking outside this whole field, take it. Because it's very political here, maybe similar to Lebanon or even worse. Like, you know, who wants to take it or not? So I don't even go there. I tell them if, you know, if you're comfortable taking, if you're not looking to get pregnant, please do. And so and many of them, I tell them, you went so far without getting it, wait, if you want to wait for more, but I don't know what's that magic number will be like you know, 4 million people have already been vaccinated. You're not going to know about pregnancy before, mm -hmm. I don't know, like a year, five years, uh, the autism later. I mean, we're not going to know any of that. No. Dr. Roni, if I may add something, because I'm, I'm uh, watching in the chat and Q and A's that many doctors are saying or asking that we know that some viruses may uh, contaminate our DNA it's completely different when the virus infects our cells, like the HIV, it, inf it infects our the messenger RNA. It is, uh, it's true that it goes through the transcriptase activity and changes into DNA inside the cell, because this change into DNA will, will keep it dividing, but this has nothing to do with contaminating our cells with DNA. It will, our DNA will not be contaminated. It's a completely different process. I don't know if the experts agree, but this is what I know. And the mRNA is not for the virus, it's for the spike protein. You're not really putting a virus, you're putting a spike protein. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not, no expert no, I'm in giving, any of this. But... I'm, giving, I'm giving the example of HIV because some doctors are quoting the HIV contamination of our DNA. Yeah, but HIV is a full virus that it changed so much, similar to the flu. Fortunately, this one doesn't change that much. But the longer we wait, it's kind of it's already have multiple variant. But I think it would be nice if you guys get like an like a like a virologist or somebody who goes that because. I mean, I didn't know any of this till when we had, we, they broke it down and two weeks ago, but initially, yeah, I was like, yeah, I want it, but I didn't read the study first because they hadn't came out. And when I read the, you know, the New England Journal and the other, like, you know, I personally felt comfortable and I took it, but 
can we can speculate as much as you want, but we know that COVID is killing people 100%. every day. Hundred percent. So we have to measure the um, exactly uh, the risk and. The... Uh, we have two two questions uh, about the Russian and the Chinese uh, vaccine. Is there any data with uh, in pregnancy? Uh, question from Dr. Mustafa Shaban. Can we use them in pregnancy? It, it's again, if someone will give you a clear answer by yes or no. Okay. I don't think no, anyone can give you a yes or no. Let's, uh, because we talked about the mRNA uh, vaccine. But, Is there any yeah. indication about the Chinese? Yani, the, the, uh, I can't see what, stop, what may stop us from using the Sputnik or the AstraZeneca vaccines during pregnancy and during breastfeeding. No okay. feedback, no study. <laughs> Yeah, and the but as an adjuvant, maybe in Europe they would not like to use adjuvant during pregnancy. When we speak about emergency usage, when you license an emergency uh, vaccine for emergency usage, it should apply also to pregnant ladies and breastfeeding ladies. Okay. Uh, a question from the thermal nanoparticles that constitute the coating of mRNA. Do they cross the placenta barrier? Do they deposit in certain tissue? What do you think? This is the big question. If the deposition, sorry, Dr. Hosni, if these no. nanoparticles go to the brain or go to other, is it, is it the same danger or suspicion of uh, a later complication uh, regarding the adjuvant in other vaccines? Nobody knows. Yes. As For you said, sure, nobody. Nobody can tell you exactly what will happen. But for example, in the Baden study, which is multi, which included, I, get, I think, uh, uh, two, two or th three groups of virologists, okay? Mm. They didn't say anything about not giving the vaccine to pregnant ladies or breastfeeding ladies. So personally, I cannot answer you these detailed questions. But as doctors, we cannot tailor our own practice according to our own personal reasoning. We should follow guidelines and recommendations. If the ASRM and the uh, and all the and the ECOG and all the societies are recommending giving the vaccine for pregnant and for, uh, and patients undergoing fertility treatment and breastfeeding ladies, why should I not follow their recommendation? 100%. Okay, thank you, Dr. I have a we question, should... just comment if you are hearing me. Yes, okay, Dr. Okay, Dr. Yeah, I, I would, uh, two comments. First, I would agree with Dr. Ghutmi and Dr. Roni. I'm advising my patients to take the vaccine. All patients, pregnant, lactating, undergoing IVF treatment or infertility treatment. Uh, this is one comment. The other comment, I asked a PhD in virology from Sweden about uh, this messenger RNA changing our DNA. And he told me that this is a science fiction. I mean, it cannot, he's, he's specialized in virology and in viruses. So I don't think uh, this messenger RNA will change the DNA about the conspiracy and all of these things. As, as for me, I'm reassured concerning this point. <clears throat> and as you mentioned, Dr. Ghutmi, I mean, the risk of the infection is much worse than any complications from the vaccines. I mean, I tell my patients that the infection might lead to your death, but, but the vaccine will not lead to any death. What complications, we don't know. The only problem that all the studies done on the vaccines, they excluded pregnant women and lactating women. And this is why we don't know. You cannot really, we don't have the evidence concerning the pregnant woman, but you should individualize and more and more, the societies are advising us 
to uh, uh, give the vaccine to pregnant uh, women, as you mentioned. Thank you. Can I ask one Thank last you. question? One last question, Dr. Gutmi, or the rest. Uh, I'm not familiar with any with anything published from the Chinese and um, Russian vaccine, just because I guess here we only we are not using them. Where, where this we were told that the data was actually not there, even about general like stuff. We're not talking about pregnant patients. Are you guys aware of that? Because you guys obviously have it, and it's being given in in the Middle East and in Europe. Not about the Chinese, but about the Sputnik, the only uh, abstract we uh, I've read, uh, which was published uh, three weeks ago or, or two weeks ago, about the efficacy of the vaccine in the general population, but not in uh, obstetrical or infertile uh, patients. Was it like a randomized, like, or they just... Like my understanding is that the phase trial is actually happening now, basically after they give it. Was it like a, like similar to the to the other two studies where it was like randomized or? Uh, not at all. Uh, okay. Not at all. I can't. I have I have the abstract, but I don't have the full uh, study. You, do you mind? Do you know where was it published? Just I can look it up. Or if you can maybe put it in the chat room. Go ahead. I, I, I look for. I look okay. For it. I, I, I mean, I can also search it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, Dr. Hbater has. Um, I don't know if it's a question or it's um, a statement that the Russian vaccine, same than AstraZeneca, has adenovirus, so live attenuated. Uh, I'm trying to find something in the. Um, Layal, yes. we should we should move on. Huh? Too late. Okay. Yeah. Go go ahead. Uh, just oh. to answer, just okay, to just... answer, it's in February the second uh, issue of the Lancet. Okay. Excellent. February second. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, controversial uh, subject. So um, now we're going to move about the uh, intrauterine insemination for unexplained infertility. Is it the time to stop? Welcome, Dr. Hadi. Thank we you, Layal. Um, and I would like to thank the Lebanese Society and Dr. Abitaya uh, for another amazing webinar. As you see, uh, we're having lots of questions and lots of interaction. Are you seeing my... Uh... Okay. So I was asked to uh, answer a much simpler question than the one before, and that is, is it time to stop performing intrauterine inseminations for unexplained infertility? And to answer that, I think we have to go to the beginning of intrauterine insemination, which is one of the oldest technologies we use in reproductive medicine. Now, the first report goes back to 1462. It's an unofficial report. And the Hen King Henry IV of Castile, who was nicknamed the impotent, and who managed to impregnate his second wife six years after marriage, thanks to a vaginal insemination. Now, a landmark date, 1678, and the first official uh, report on uh, human spermatozoa in the Netherlands by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. And more than 100 years later, the first official report of an insemination by John Hunter it was obviously a vaginal insemination. Uh, he advised the patient of his with severe hypospadias to collect the sperm uh, in a warm syringe and inject it in the vagina of his wife, and she got pregnant and delivered. So it took a lot of time and a lot of research for IUI to become the treatment it is today. You can see here, it's been almost 70 years since we had the first pregnancy using frozen sperm with an insemination. So what's the rationale behind IUI? How does it help fertility? Uh, we know that the human fertility rates are among the lowest on the planet. And one of the causes is supposedly uh, the low capacity of the sperm to reach 
the oocyte and to fertilize it. And we know from the 70s, studies from the 70s shown that after vaginal insemination, only 0.1% of the sperm will reach the cervix and only one in 14 million will reach the oocyte. So how does insemination help? Well, first of all, it increases the sperm density because we're putting it right in the uterus next to the oocyte. By washing the sperm, we're eliminating all the dead cells, all the debris, and therefore we're helping the spermatozoa to reach their fertilization potential. And finally, we're timing it right around ovulation to increase the chances of fertilization. So today, IUI is a very uh, common treatment used worldwide because it's simple, it's non-invasive, it's cheap, and of course, you don't need uh, much infrastructure for it. Now, there are lots of indications for IUI. Some are clear-cut, some are confirmed, and some are more controversial, and none more so than unexplained infertility, which accounts for about 15 to 30% of the cases we see. Now, when we say unexplained infertility, we mean we have a normal sperm count, uh, and ovulatory cycles, patent tubes, and of course, normal hormonal workup. Now, IUI has been used for infertility, for unexplained infertility for quite a while. But in 2013, the NICE published their guidelines and recommended against the use of IUI for unexplained infertility. And that is with or without ovarian stimulation. And they recommended to go straight to IVF after two years of trial. Now, these guidelines were only based on two RCTs, uh, the Bhattacharya trial in 2009, I guess, and the uh, FAST trial in 2010 which had shown that IUI is not better than expected management and lower than IVF for these patients. And following these guidelines, uh, a lot of countries saw a reduction in the number of IUIs, especially countries that follow these recommendations. So if you wanna talk about the role of IUI in couples with unexplained infertility, we have to compare it to all other management possibilities. And we have four treatments. First, we have expected management. We just tell the couple to keep trying at home. We can do insemination in a natural cycle. We can do insemination in a stimulated cycle using either oral drugs or gonadotropins, and we can use IVF. So we're gonna start the comparison first using uh, comparing IUI in natural cycles to IUI in stimulated cycles. Now, there have been lots of studies back in the 90s and the 2000s comparing these two. We're not gonna go through them because most of them are outdated. I will just quote the ASRM practice committee from last year. Uh, which based on seven RCTs and six cohort studies recommended not to perform IUI in natural cycles. And this, has, this is seen in many other recommendations. Unfortunately, to date, we still see doctors performing IUI in natural cycles for couples with unexplained this infertility, and this clearly has to stop. The second comparison is versus expectant management. Now, again, there have been many studies. I will cite this one uh, published in The Lancet from two years ago by Cynthia Farquhar and colleagues from New Zealand. What they did is they took couples with unexplained infertility and the low chance of conception, and they randomized them to either three cycles of ovarian stimulation, user clomiphene or letrozole, to three months of expected management. And as you can see, the live birth rate was significantly higher, well, almost three times higher with ovarian stimulation. The live birth rate per cycle of IUI was equivalent to three months of expected management. And finally, the multiple pregnancy rate, which is the most common complication and the most feared one in IUI, was about 6%, which was considered acceptable. So this study confirmed what you already know is that ovarian stimulation and IUI is much better than expected management. So if you're gonna stimulate these patients for IUI, how do you do that? Well, we have three options. We have the oral meds, clomiphene or letrozole, and we have gonadotropins. There have been many studies comparing these three. I will cite this one, the Amigos trial, which was published in New England uh, in 2016. This is the same network that had shown that uh, letrozole was first line for uh, uh, PCOS patients. So they randomized 900 women to either letrozole, clomiphene, or gonadotropin. All had unexplained infertility of at least a year. Now, the primary outcome of the study was the multiple pregnancy rate and the secondary outcome was the live birth rate. Now, when they compared letrozole to the combination of these two, it was significantly lower, but comparing them head to head, there was no difference between clomiphene and letrozole, and both had a lower live birth rate than gonadotropins. But when you look at the primary outcome, the multiple pregnancy rate was significantly higher with gonadotropins compared to clomiphene and letrozole, and they only saw triplets 
and the gonadotropin arm. So the study concluded that gonadotropins gave a higher live birth rate, but at the price of higher multiple pregnancies. Now, this is a meta-analysis from late 2019 published in Fertility Sterility that compared oral drugs to gonadotropins. There were eight trials and more than 6,000 cycles. For the live birth rate, out of the five studies, two showed a significant improvement with gonadotropins, while three did not, and the overall difference was not significant. For the multiple pregnancy rate, the same. Two studies showed higher multiple rates, but overall, the difference was not significant. Now, the authors performed the sensitivity analysis, and they had two subgroups. They chose the group where the study is where the uh, authors used low doses of gonadotropin, 75 units, and they used strict cancellation criteria. And that by that, they mean uh, cancel any cycle that had more than three follicles above 14 millimeter. Now, these studies, if you, if you look at the result of these studies alone, they showed that gonadotropins do not increase the rate of pregnancies, nor the multiple pregnancy rates. But if you look at the studies that had higher doses and lax cancellation criteria, you can see that the clinical pregnancy rate was increased, but the increase was much more significant when it comes to multiple pregnancy. So the authors concluded that the use of gonadotropins and IUI is not, uh, is not a good first option for infertility because the increase in multiple pregnancy rates is more important than the increase in clinical pregnancy. This is another meta-analysis uh, a year later published in Human Production Update. Again, they compared uh, all the medications used for stimulation before IUI and unexplained infertility. There were more than 4,000 women. When they did the head-to-head -head comparison, there wasn't much difference, but when they pulled the results, they showed that the live birth rate was significantly high with gonadotropins, followed by letrozole, followed by clomiphene, and finally in the natural cycles. And again, they looked at the multiple pregnancy rate. They took, at the, took the studies that did not adhere to the strict cancellation criteria, which is more than three particles above 14. In these studies, the multiple pregnancy rate was higher. And in the studies that adhered to the strict cancellation criteria, there was comparable. So contrary to the, to the former one, this study recommended the use of gonadotropins and IUI for unexplained infertility as long as you adhere to the strict cancellation criteria. And to end the debate between these two, these are the recommendations of the SRM from last year. First line is the clomiphene with IUI for unexplained infertility. They recommend to use the letrozole as an alternative since letrozole does not have the FDA approval for unexplained infertility. ASRM does not recommend the use of combination medications, oral and gonadotropins, since it does not improve the pregnancy rates. They do not recommend to use low-dose gonadotropins because it's much more complex, it's more expensive, and it does not improve the live birth rate. And they do not recommend the use of conventional doses because it increases the multiple pregnancy rate without, with the, the increase in pregnancy rates actually is due to the increase in multiple pregnancy rates. And the third comparison, is with our gold standards, IVF uh, with or without ICSI. Again, there have been many trials. Uh, I'm going to cite just a couple. This one, uh, the INES trial from the Netherlands in 2015, where they randomized more than 600 women to either three cycles of IVF with single embryo transfer, six cycles of ovarian stimulation and IUI, and six cycles of natural cycle IVF. Now, for the IUI, they used either clomiphene or 75 units of gonadotropins. And they used strict cancellation criteria, canceling cycles with more follicles than 14 millimeter. Uh, if you look at the results, the live birth rates were comparable between the three, and the multiple pregnancy rates were also comparable, around 5%. And this study also dispelled the myth that IVF leads to a shorter time to pregnancy, since the time to pregnancy, as you can see, was comparable. And this is not an RCT, this one coming from the UK, uh, again published in Fertility Sterility comparing three cycles of ovarian stimulation and IUI to one cycle of IVF. Ovarian stimulation was done with 75 units of gonadotropins, and they used strict cancellation criteria. Again, the outcomes were comparable uh, for the live birth rate, for the multiple pregnancy rates around 10%. And of course, if you look at the live birth rate per cycle, it was significantly lower with, a very, uh, with the insemination, but this is why you have to go to three inseminations to reach that number. Now, there are two other uh, results uh, that are interesting in that study. First of all, the cost analysis. Uh, that was not an objective of the study, but they performed a direct comparison and it showed it favored IUI. 
Now for the cost analysis, this is something that's quite different between countries, between uh, reimbursement programs, even between centers. I can tell you, for instance, that uh, at St. Joseph Fertility Center, if we were to compare three cycles of IUI, it would be cheaper, of course, than one cycle of IVF. And the second um, result is the rate of spontaneous conception, which was really good, about 8%. And this is something that we have to keep in mind when counseling patients uh, with unexplained infertility, that this can occur uh, over the course of the treatment. So uh, these studies have shown that ovarian stimulation and IOI is as efficient as IVF, but this is not the case for everyone. As uh, this excellent trial, the 40T trial was uh, showed in 2014, they looked at women only 38 to 42 years of age, and they randomized them to either uh, IOI for, uh, with clomiphene, two cycles, two cycles of gonadotropins with IOI, and two cycles of IVF. And as you can see here, the live birth rate was significantly higher when they went straight to IVF and uh, they required fewer treatments. So it was a quicker time to pregnancy. And uh, this is, comes from the Belgian, um, Belgian national report where you can see that the IVF XC outcomes are way better in women over 40. So to finish with that comparison, uh, again, back to the SRM uh, guidelines based on 12 RCTs and eight cohort studies, it is recommended to start with three to four cycles of ovarian stimulation using oral agents. If that is not, does not work, then you should go to IVF. You should skip uh, going to gonadotropins. And women less than 38, as I said, you go to IVF. Now, there's a point that was, uh, that was very important to, uh, to talk about, and that's the, many of the studies that compare IUI to IVF were done uh, more than 10 years ago at a time where IVF success rates were probably lower than now. So this comparison, IOI to IVF, needs to be updated every now and then to make sure that we're on the same page because IVF uh, success rates are improving, whereas IOI success rates are somewhat stagnant for the past decades. And of course, in women above 38 years of age, uh, the indication is to go straight to IVF. So as I've said, uh, IUI rates have been stagnant and many authors, uh, many teams have tried to, uh, many ways to try and improve these rates. Uh, lots of experimental uh, stuff, we're not gonna go through them. Uh, just a quick word about the use of antagonists for IUI uh, has not shown any improvement in results. Uh, the correlation between DNA fragmentation and live birth rates in uh, IUI, again, uh, not very clear. Double IUI is not more efficient than single IUI. As for scratching, well, again, uh, I think there's something that uh, is still uh, being looked at, whether it's for IVF or for IUI, because there have been some recent studies showing an improvement with scratching. But again, this is very controversial. I'm going to talk about these two, the luteal phase support and the HPV. Uh, this is a meta-analysis looking at the luteal phase support in uh, insemination, uh, published uh, two years ago. Uh, the study showed that when you're using gonadotropins, uh, for stimulation before IUI, adding vaginal progesterone significantly improves the live birth rate. Whereas when you're stimulating using clomiphene, it did not have any impact. And that improvement uh, was per cycle and per patient. Uh, the most plausible explanation is that when you're using gonadotropins, you're stimulating, stimulating the follicles to produce estrogen, which will have a negative feedback on the pituitary uh, and thus uh, impact the LH surge and, of course, impact the corpus luteum in the luteal phase. Whereas using clomiphene or letrozole, uh, you're not impacting the endogenous surge, and this could be an explanation. Now, all these studies use vaginal progesterone. And as you know, uh, oral dadrogesterone has recently made a comeback in the field of IVF uh, based on the LOTUS 1 and 2 trial. And a lot of doctors have been using it uh, for insemination based on the simple fact that if it can do a job in IVF, it most certainly can do it in IUI. So now we're seeing more and more direct comparison between these two. Uh, of course, there's still lots of controversies about the impact of the register on, on, um, uh, on the fetus and the risk of congenital malformations. But the studies comparing these two head to head seem to be uh, fine. And we know that the adrogesterone is cheaper and it's uh, much uh, well tolerated, better tolerated than vaginal. Uh, and finally, a word about HPV. Uh, we're seeing more and more studies about the impact of HPV on uh, natural fertility, on IVF success rates, as well as insemination. This comes from Belgium uh, last year, a prospective observational study that involved about 1,300 cycles. 
The study showed that the prevalence of HPV in the partner sperm was 18%. And according to the authors, this was an underestimation uh, because of technical difficulties with the um, HPV testing. Now they found that the clinical pregnancy rate per IUI cycle was four times lower in men who had HPV in their sperm. So women were four times less likely to get pregnant. And they even calculated the cutoff value of uh, 66 HPV variants per 100 spermatozoa, above which they found no clinical pregnancies. Uh, this is a meta-analysis uh, published last year in Fertility Sterility, looking at the impact of HPV on, uh, on the sperm count, on the sperm parameters, and on the ART outcomes. Now, they found that there was negative impact on the sperm count and the motility and the morphology, but mostly on the motility. As for the impact on the ART outcomes, there haven't been many studies. There seems to be a trend towards lower pregnancy rate, but mostly an increase in miscarriage rates in HPV-positive sperm. Now, suppose if, if it does have uh, uh, an, an impact, uh, how do you treat that? Well, we have two, two ways of doing it. We have the vaccination uh, as a prophylaxis, And of course, there's a debate about which sperm washing technique to use to uh, remove HPV. Some will tell you with the classic, some will tell you the swim up, others will use the HIV technique. So there's a lot of discussion going on about which uh, techniques to use when preparing the sperm, whether it's for IUI or for IVF. So to conclude, uh, is it time to stop? No, it's not time to stop performing inseminations, but it's time to perform them uh, in certain indications. So we should stop doing IUI natural cycles because it's not more efficient than expecting management. Uh, for unexplained infertility, obviously. Uh, always start with three to four cycles of IUI with oral stimulation, whether it's clomiphene or letrozole. Uh, the use of gonotropins obviously uh, does improve the outcomes, but at the rate of higher multiple pregnancy rates, and of course, at a higher cost. By using strict cancellation criteria, we could uh, reduce these multiple pregnancy rates. And of course, uh, this has to be discussed with the patients because there's patient preference, there's the cost and everything. Uh, according to many studies, three cycles of ovarian stimulation with IUI seem to be as efficient as one cycle of IVF in women less than 30 years of age. But in women more than 30 years of age, uh, the indication is uh, to go straight to IVF. Thank you. Thank you, Hadi. Uh, Hadi, what is the indication to give uh, in this per when you when you when you uh, ask for this exam, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't hear you. I, it's it's uh, what's the indication? When you ask to 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 seek a PCR in a sperm, and when, when you search it. Well, the thing is, uh, if I understand the, the because uh, the question is, when do you look for HPV? Is that it? My yes. PCR had you. Why? When? Yes. When, yes. well, the thing when, is, when, yeah, the thing is, if you, it's not really uh, so far. It hasn't been in any recommendations because it's we we now are seeing studies. There have been some studies that didn't show any impact of of HPV um, on the fertility on the outcomes of ART. So this is why it's not in any recommendations. But if you look at the trend, there seems to be that uh, there is an impact and that we should look for it. Uh, if you look at the Belgian study, uh, they looked for it in all uh, the patients uh, in the trial. And the, argue, the question was, should they do it for all donor sperms? Because they have lots of donor sperm donation there. And the debate is, is whether you should do it or not. So for now, there's not a clear indication. But if the studies keep coming up with, uh, with results showing an impact on outcomes, then I think it should be a part of the initial screening. And as I said in the slide, uh, we should probably, we, if we have a biologist on board, they could uh, give us more info about the techniques because there's lots of controversy about which technique. Some will say that the, the, the classic swim up is enough to remove the HPV. Some will say it's not. And even testing for HPV, uh, it depends on how you test for it because some will count the variant, some will do a PCR and the results differ quite significantly between these two. So for now there isn't any consensus, but there seems to be a trend toward testing HPV uh, more and more. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, we are in a private practice, and maybe we have to take the consideration of the will of the patient. Um, 
do you think if you have a patient after two failure of IVF, uh, sorry, of insemination, willing to go to IVF, do you advise her uh, to uh, go for the third IUI or you keep her, uh, keep her uh, making the choice? Yeah, I know. And I can say honestly, uh, uh, I mean, all, most of us, we do much more in IVF than we do insemination. And uh, I think we're doing less insemination that we should for obvious reasons, because even we, when you look at the cost efficiency, we say it's not, it's cheaper, but still quite significant for these patients. And since we're in a private practice, uh, all doctors are afraid to lose the patient because she'll try once, second, third time, and then she'll leave. So from my personal experience, very few patients go to three inseminations. Yeah. I can tell you that most of them will just try one, two, and after that, they will tell you they've had enough and they want to go to IVF. This is why I, it's time consuming, I know. And this is why, I mean, when, we, when I look back at the studies for this presentation, the, the, uh, the science is here. It says it's as, as good as IVF, but I think most of us in personal and private practice will say that it's not. Uh, 100%. I was expecting an opposite result today. Exactly. exactly. Oh, I was expecting you telling that let's stop insemination for uh, unexplained infertility or at least do once and go then for IVF no. as a cost effectiveness. But you know, the, most of these studies come from, uh, come from countries. Most of these studies come from countries where it's, uh, where it's a dream boost. It's, it's, it's social security, so they have to go to IUI. So I don't know if this, me, if this results in a bias in the studies, but I think the same goes for most of us in private practice. We're not seeing that. Because uh, had, you were in Beclair and at a certain point they discussed going to IVF directly instead of losing time with two insemination or three. Exactly. Months. With the new results. So I think based on these results, we can, I mean, I, we can cancel our patients. I tell them that if you want to go to IUI, you have to go to three at that cost, et cetera, et cetera. But I think most here in Lebanon will go to IVF. We have a question for, from Dr. Hadi Jalik. In IVF, how do you tackle the ethical issue of inseminated ovules that are not used? The frozen, uh, the frozen embryos, uh, I think uh, Dr. Hadi means. Yes. Well, what we do is, uh, this is something we discussed obviously with the couples before and uh, the couples who have a, an ethical or religious problem with that, we don't inseminate all the eggs. Uh, we inseminate just the right amount so we don't have extra embryos. Uh, and, uh, and therefore we don't have the problem of having more embryos not being used. So there's something that we discussed with them before uh, let's say if we have 10 oocytes, we'll tell them we're going to fertilize five based on the, on the statistic that we get to two embryos at the end of the day and transfer them, but not more than that. Okay. And uh, maybe we have a last question from Dr. Mohamed Shahab. Uh, uh, I will read it in French. Vous faites toujours au cours d'une insémination la perfusion tubaire des spermes préparés? J'ai pas compris. I'm not familiar with that technique. Uh, what we do is we do the classic uh, washing, uh, the, uh, the swim up, and, uh, and that's it. We don't do anything in particular. Probably in this uh, bad, uh, bad economic conditions, they <laughs> will go toward insemination. They rather than you. Especially with the lockdown, Dr. Shalhou. Let them focus yes. on the natural, uh, natural pregnancy. Natural. <laughs> okay. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank Perfect. you to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have to go with the Dr. George It was perfect, really. It was an amazing uh, webinar. Uh, thank you for all the attendees to be with us tonight. There were more than uh, 150. I want to thank all the speakers, Dr. Hashem still with us, Dr. Hutmi, thank you for in your introduction, and uh, Dr. Decon from Paris, it was perfect. Thank you, Layal, thank you, Simon, for the moderating, really, it was amazing with you. Big, thank big you thanks, me. big, big thanks to Merck. Uh, Merck is a sponsor for our webinars, uh, and uh, without them, uh, this webinar can't happen. Thanks for Science Pro also for all its technical support and hope to see you soon in our next webinar in March. So thank you again to be with us tonight and stay safe and have a good evening.
Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye. It's all right, go. <laughs> okay. Ten. <laughs>